People feel more strongly about RPGs than I think they do about any other genre out there. I think about why and all I get are flashbacks of spending upwards of 50 hours exploring an exciting new world full of wonder and being obsessed with an engaging story that throws out one twist and dramatic moment after another. That lengthy completion time is important because you really do need an RPG to keep you invested, otherwise those dozens of hours will start to drag and you begin to ponder the many ways you might have spent that time better. I mean, shit, if you're plugging 50 hours into a game that isn't even all that good, that has to hurt. Which is why I think JRPGs are under more pressure to be good than any other genre out there. With like platformers and first person shooters, it doesn't really matter if they're a bit shit since you weren't going to get huge playtimes out of them anyway. At their best, RPGs are incredible time sinks. And then at their worst, they're incredible wastes of time. By that reasoning, I reckon RPGs suffer more from being bad than any other genre out there, if just because they seem to have further to fall. I've been disappointed by many an RPG in the past, but I've always been impressed by the sheer variety of ways in which one of these games can underwhelm. When you have so many moving parts that all come together with such a great synergy when done well, it shouldn't be any surprise at all that these components can easily fall away when not managed properly, and can produce some pretty awful video games. If you like, you can see this video as some kind of public service because I don't know about you, but I'd hate to gear myself up for some epic adventure only to discover 30 hours in that I'm playing a terrible video game. It's a learning experience we all must go through at some point. Maybe I should let you find it out for yourself. The first thing that you're going to notice is that the definition of a JRPG has been changed and morphed a lot over the years. I guess this is a long video about the very worst that the genre has to offer, so I suppose I should start by explaining what makes an RPG the way it is and how it can go oh so wrong. Uh, turn-based combat is a good start, as well as other key components of the genre like a larger-than-life narrative that spans numerous settings and locations, and a fairly lengthy playtime somewhere in the couple of dozens of hours. These aren't prerequisites, but they're a good barometer for identifying an RPG with the extra J simply denoting that the game was either made in Japan or inspired by Japanese RPGs. Paper Mario Sticker Star is technically all of these, and technically it fails at most of them. There may or may not have been a time when this game was a controversial subject among fans of Mario RPGs as legions of people slowly started to work out how they feel about this game, but it's many years later now and I think the general consensus is significantly more negative now. Mario RPGs of all shapes and sizes have such a great pedigree that Sticker Star stands out as a painfully sore thumb that flattened out any interesting design details from previous games in favour of everything being stickers. I hope you like stickers because, ah, oh, there's, there's a lot of them. Until there isn't, and you're forced to bend over backwards to get through fights about your finite resources. Conceptually, I don't think Sticker Star is a complete disaster, but I don't think it's any coincidence that the Paper Mario franchise hasn't recovered since this game. Color Splash isn't even all that bad as well. Goes to show that scars take a while to heal. Subgenres make all of this very complicated. JRPGs, for the most part, are their own thing that almost exists as their own separate entity compared to other genres. But as some developers have gone a little bit bored of simplistic turn-based combat and pine for something more exciting, they've evolved into strategy RPGs and action RPGs, and as long as they're still Japanese, we're in business, lads. I reckon I can make a few allowances for games that introduced a new style of RPGing since first steps can often be very messy. The strategy RPG genre came into existence in the mid-1980s with a handful of titles attempting and mostly failing to bring this idea to light, but it started to gain traction once Final Fantasy Tactics and Fire Emblem showed the rest of the world how to do it. These two quickly set about becoming reliable stalwarts of the tactical RPG genre, and I'd like to say they're both still going strong now, but there hasn't been a new tactics game for a number of years, while Fire Emblem is churning out new games to great critical acclaim. But it wasn't that long ago that Fire Emblem was trying something a little different with Fire Emblem Fates, a game that promised difficult decisions that would shape your adventure, but ultimately delivered something less than that. 
I can get along with Birthright and Conquest since they offer up two different perspectives of a conflict with alternative approaches to the same type of game. Conquest is generally harder, while Birthright lets you grind levels if you want a more casual, forgiving challenge. Important characters die in both games, and for the most part, they don't have terrible stories. That's reserved for the unwanted ginger stepchild of the family revelation that attempts to tie both sides together in a nice neat little bow while also smoothing out the moral dilemma of both sides being at least a little bit morally reprehensible by having all the evil in the world controlled by an ancient dragon in an invisible kingdom hidden at the bottom of a valley. And I know this sounds very video gamey but I also hate how stupid and unnecessary this game is. I admire the scope of Revelation since it does have to act as the definitive version of Fire Emblem Fates and therefore has to pull together characters from both factions and give them all support conversations to unlock. But I feel like the aim here was to have a satisfying conclusion in a story that was never likely to get one organically and as a consequence the end product feels ham fisted and a little bit corny. You're trying to find a perfectly happy ending where there shouldn't be one and the cracks do start to show very quickly. Just let everyone die and leave me alone. So you remember those rules I outlined at the start? Yeah, we don't need them where we're going. YouTube has been tearing up their own rulebook for years, why should I even try to follow one? Plus, I want an excuse to talk about Sonic Chronicles, and I'm not likely to get a better one. When you think JRPG juggernauts, you just don't think about Sonic being one of them. And that makes a lot of sense, considering that it was Bioware who were given the Sonic license to play with by Sega. Is this game still a JRPG even if Bioware are based in Alberta, Canada? Well, if the mechanics are all reminiscent of a typical JRPG, then why the hell not? It's not like Champagne, where it has to be made in a particular part of the world to be considered genuine. Gaming does not need more pretense these days. Do you honestly think that a JRPG headed by everyone's favourite blue hedgehog by default would be an instant classic? Well, if you've got doubts over this game's quality, then congratulations! You've officially had more trepidation and concern in 10 seconds than anyone on this production team had in 3 years of development. Sonic Chronicles The Dark Brotherhood is a bit of an odd package since it's mechanically solid and visually appealing, but at the cost of any depth or any great challenge beneath the surface level. This works for Baby's first RPG, but you put this down in front of anyone else and they'll quickly pick it apart for being a bare bone shell of a game with a story that doesn't really do anything or go anywhere. Compare Sonic Chronicles with another big franchise attempt at a simplistic RPG and Mario and Luigi Superstar Saga is leagues ahead of this in every way. Plus, Superstar Saga doesn't have redone music that had to be rushed before the game came out and hurts every inch of my eardrum, so it's not a fair comparison. I like to say that Sega learned their lesson and stuck to what they knew worked with Sonic for the next decade, but um, they didn't. Would have saved them a lot of time and money if they did. Did you know that anyone can make an RPG in these modern times? Yeah, I know it's crazy to think about, but game dev tools are available to anyone who seeks them out and applications like RPG Maker have been around since the early 1990s, so I think it's safe to assume that those people who want to make RPGs are somewhere in the process of making them if they haven't already. But therein lies the main problem. Just because everyone can make a JRPG these days doesn't mean that everyone should. Brian Allenson is the main driving force behind Yik, a postmodern RPG, a game that attempts to evoke nostalgic 90s memories through the eyes of its unabashedly terrible protagonist. Allenson was clearly influenced by games like Earthbound, but swapped the irresistible charm for a supposed relatable protagonist who complains about tiny things all through the game and never does anything to elevate himself above being hideously unlikable. The gameplay itself isn't too wild, but even some neat mechanics and features don't do enough to distract you from a wild convoluted story and an abhorrent main character who never undergoes sufficient character development to justify his actions and behaviour. RPGs have had shitty characters before, but I just don't relate to this man. That makes this a hard game to play at the best of times. The added little detail that makes Yik even more of a dodgy video game is the accusations of plagiarism leveled against creator Brian Allenson for apparently copying entire passages of text for this game. Also, Yik does make reference to the real life death of a woman from a couple of years ago who died in mysterious circumstances and 
That just makes me feel a little bit icky thinking about this game. Or yicky, I guess. So yeah, RPGs are easy to make because the fundamental formula behind them acts like a very easy to follow flowchart. Maybe that's why so many RPGs feel the need to jazz things up a bit and go wild with their stories as a way of coming off as so much more than just another RPG. There's a real danger that if an RPG is generic enough, it'll feel just like every other turn-based adventure starring wizards and monsters that may have been the focus of 13-year-old Timmy's first afternoon in RPG Maker. As late as 1998, the Nintendo 64 didn't have any RPGs on it, which must have been seen as a major oversight considering the competition and their suspiciously Final Fantasy VII shaped weaponry. That being said, I don't think Quest 64 was ever designed to topple Final Fantasy VII, but instead to maybe inspire other developers and show them how RPGs could be managed on the N64. Oh, so that's why we only had about four of them. Hey, it's not so bad, eventually we got Paper Mario out of all this, but in 1998 we did have to endure Quest 64, the first RPG on the N64 and also some of the least game you could ever hope to get from the genre. If Sonic Chronicles acts as Baby's first disappointing JRPG, Quest 64 is likely suited for the still warm contents of the average ballsack, that almost relishes its simplicity and the role it plays in introducing new players to the genre. The problem is that other games are able to do this without skimping on the quality, and can appeal to a wide spectrum of ages without dumbing things down to the lowest common denominator. Again, there's nothing wrong with making a simple RPG, but when it's this simple and the story never gets more complicated than go defeat bad guy for doing bad things, you start to realise what features are most valuable for making a competent JRPG. Namely, some variety to the gameplay and a story that introduces characters that I give a rat's ass about. This empty shell though? I feel very little, other than an urge to make my own and do so much better. Oh, we're really getting into our stride now! Do you know how I can tell? Well, the first version of Final Fantasy XIV was so bad, so irredeemably awful, that Square Enix decided that the only natural course of action was to tear it all down and start it again, annihilating everything in a spectacular fireball of destruction that gave life to a brand new JRPG that shared the name, but very few of the same features. Now, if you're so embarrassed by what you've made that the only logical step in your mind is to set it all on fire and start from scratch, I think it's safe to say with a fair deal of confidence that you've made one of the worst JRPGs in the history of the genre. And damn, this game doesn't even have lightning in it. That would have been enough reason to burn it to the ground. The push to drag popular role-playing franchises into an online setting hasn't always been successful, as Bethesda may reluctantly agree with, but I don't think many people could have anticipated just how shockingly bad the initial release of Final Fantasy XIV could be. The trendy thing these days is to put a game out in the world into a half-finished state and piece everything together with future updates. Final Fantasy XIV was way ahead of the curve in this regard and featured so many bugs and performance issues that it was borderline unplayable at launch, with very few players having anything even vaguely resembling an enjoyable experience with it. It's a shame too, since there had clearly been a lot of work put into it at a conceptual stage and there was an interesting world to explore given the right structure, but it just didn't happen. Small updates came and went before the leader of the development team was replaced and the decision was made to rip it all up and get a new game going instead. Which is a drastic step whichever way you shake it. Final Fantasy XIV A Realm Reborn is currently very popular and rocking an impressive Metacritic score, so I don't think anyone out there actively pines for the original game. Earlier this year, the man who pulled this game out of the fire, Naoki Yoshida, was asked if Square would ever launch classic servers for Final Fantasy XIV. Um, no? That's almost a war crime. One bad mechanic is easily enough to derail a whole video game. I couldn't tell you the number of times I've rolled my eyes into the back of my head when a game insta-kills me, or forces me to follow an NPC who doesn't quite walk at a speed that considers my needs. But this all seemed very tame when compared to one unfortunate DS game from 2005. 
And hey, I wish I was talking about Advance Wars on Nintendogs, but instead, I'm backed into a corner and forced to talk about Lunar Dragon Song. One of the first JRPGs released on the console, but also one of the worst ever. This is a franchise that never made it to Europe until now, which is a damn shame, since previous games were well received when they came out in the 90s, but after a 10 year wait, Dragon Song is a bit of an embarrassment. I can understand that new technology can be hard to get to grips with and bringing your exciting RPG series to the DS after a significant absence is a lot of work, but it's almost like Lunar Dragon Song throws a ton of awful ideas around to distract the player from missing features like voice acting. It's very hard to get around the fact that you take damage when you sprint or having to choose between item drops or experience drops or dealing with really slow animations due to poorly optimized performance. Think of it like a slightly less forgivable Quest 64 that tackled new hardware but wasn't able to make it into a decent video game. Save for some remakes and re-releases, this is the last we've seen from this franchise and at this point, I'm beginning to notice a trend. RPGs take a long time and effort to make, if it isn't working, why bother? Shame to go out on such a limp note though. Due to their scale and the fact that they demand a lot of attention to get the most out of them, I think RPGs are my least played genre at this point. Far from my least favourite though, because I'll still find something like Persona 5 or Chrono Trigger that really gets the most out of the genre, but I just haven't got any time for bad ones. They need to do something more for me. And honestly, the idea of a game based on a fictional console wars that parodies tropes from a real life thing that is already pretty stupid and being actively disbanded by crossplay between consoles, this should make for a pretty entertaining video game. Then again, Hyperdimension Neptunia comes of anthropomorphized parody versions of seventh generation consoles, and why does the Wii have boobs? I can tolerate a lot, but I'm not sure I can handle a sexy body pillow of a PlayStation goddess. Is this where video games have led us? Really? Even unnecessary sexiness aside, Hyperdimension Neptunia has one hell of an identity crisis, and most of it is handled really poorly. It wants to be a visual novel with minimal gameplay, which would probably be the best place this game could have gone, but somehow we've managed to work in a snail paced combat system that you use to crawl your way through devastatingly boring dungeons until you have the life sucked away from every fibre of your being and beg for the vapid conversations with overly sexualised young girls. At least I can feel something here, even if it is just a deep, warm feeling of shame running down my spine. This is a big franchise consisting of numerous games, manga, anime, and the occasional body pillow, but it seems like most of the games are similarly shaky for quality. Often feels like a thinly veiled excuse for showing off more anime girls under the vague pretense of being a video game. And the fact that a parody game about the console wars isn't comedy gold is really annoying to me. Certainly the most Japanese of RPGs in this video. Time travel as a video game mechanic hasn't been used anywhere near as much as I would want. Maybe it was exposure to Zelda games like Majora's Mask and Oracle of Ages that aptly demonstrate the creativity you could have with time travel and how manipulating time can open up so many doors for puzzle solving and altering the environment around you. Honestly, I wish I was sick of seeing this because I've never been disappointed by a game at the very least attempting to do some wizardry with time. Just a few months after Majora's Mask came out, Konami were releasing a very exciting new IP by the name of Ephemeral Fantasia on the PS2, having originally planned for a Dreamcast release but delayed when it became evident that this wasn't such a good idea. An unfulfilled game concept on a console that didn't sell so well? These two would have been made for each other! Ephemeral Fantasia has exactly one redeeming quality and I've already talked about it. The looping day limit that Majora's Mask had already used to such great effect a few months prior was expanded to include five days in Ephemeral Fantasia that you'd be forced to relive until you defeated the big bad and saved the world. Unfortunately, any early promise was quickly diffused once you get into the meat of the action and it slowly dawns on you just how tedious every aspect of this game is. Even worse than that, the tedium starts to infect every semi-decent feature of Ephemeral Fantasia, and suddenly the time travelling, one of my favourite features from one of my favourite games of all time, starts to become irritating. Even with a name as glorious as Ephemeral Fantasia, you can't get away with that. It's just a wee bit shameful.
If you need any kind of takeaway from this video, hopefully it will be something along the line of it being easy to make an RPG, but also very easy to trip over a dozen or more hazards that can render the average GRPG a mundane struggle for even an ounce of genuine quality. If you blur your eyes enough, most RPGs start to look the same with all their turn-based combat and dramatic protagonist, but it's this kind of familiarity that sometimes provokes some developers to go out of their way to reinvent the genre with new ideas. Unlimited Saga attempted to do this in 2003, and with Square Enix at the helm, how could they possibly fail? I don't know, let's roll this roulette wheel and find out. Random Chance is already a well-known adversary of the RPG genre since there's enough variables without having to roll some dice every time you want to get anything done. By the time that Unlimited Saga came out, it was the ninth game in a well-established series of RPGs that were never too insane but sometimes branched out to cover new territory, like how the Final Fantasy Legend was the first RPG on a handheld. The approach taken with Unlimited Saga was a drastic shift though, with Square choosing to make this RPG more of a board game that relies heavily on the spin of a roulette to determine what happens, and how much the game wants to fuck you up. It's like Dokkabon Kingdom, but single player, and with no friends to dick over, it is you who is the one who is dicked. And I'd rather not be. Unlimited Saga barely resembles a video game, let alone an RPG. It's the kind of game where you can glance at some out of context footage of it and feel the confusion rise up from within you that a collection of human beings somehow turn this into a video game. With battling being such a key component of RPGs, Unlimited Saga has a system that takes hours to truly understand, and being able to move one space at a time on this board game of an overworld only serves to make this game significantly more boring. I actually wish it was more boring, because the only time it isn't, it's kicking the crap out of you. It really does fuck up your hierarchy of needs, this game. This is Rebel Luigi, and maybe the wildest thing about Unlimited Saga is how much it was praised in Japan. It was universally panned when it reached the West, but for some reason, numerous Japanese publications enjoyed a lot about this game for a reason that I'm not so sure of. I mean, is it possible that we're just missing something obvious here? Is it just really enjoyable with the Japanese language on? I don't really know. What I do know is that this is the last Saga game to be released in Europe, and honestly, I reckon we'll be fine. There's enough pain here for a, a goddamn lifetime.